Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, anyone who has watched my content knows that my channel is a hair loss channel and that I am a hair YouTuber. Or more specifically, I am a hair loss witcher. Occasionally, though, I have been accused by some of focusing way too much on finasteride. I've even been accused of being a finasteride shill every now and then and that I should rename my channel Fin Cafe. Now, as effective and safe as finasteride may be, some think that I should expand my horizons and focus on treatment modalities outside of finasteride and other 5AR inhibitors. Now, let me be perfectly clear here. There is nothing particularly special to me about finasteride other than the fact that it actually works. Since it is one of the very few clinically proven treatments to work, it would be nonsensical for me not to advocate for it on this channel, which is meant to be a resource for effective hair loss treatments, which of course finasteride qualifies as. A hair loss channel that doesn't promote finasteride, it would be like a strength channel that doesn't promote barbell training. However, one should not confuse my enthusiasm for finasteride with closed-mindedness. No, on the contrary, I absolutely welcome new innovations in treating hair loss, and I made many videos on upcoming hair loss treatments in the pipeline, many of which I've spoken enthusiastically about on this channel. Truth be told, though, I don't posit myself as some sort of hair loss guru, and I never have. I'm not a doctor or a dermatologist. My educational background is actually in kinesiology, which is the science of human movement. But my passion for the science of hair loss, it comes from my many years of experience fighting against the slaphead curse. And the knowledge that I share with you fellow hair loss witchers, it comes from my competency in properly interpreting hair loss research, which is something I taught myself after having been misled by so much misinformation and fear-mongering in the past. Simply put, the objective of my channel is to make sure that you have access to the information I wish I had access to when I first started losing my hair. I want to be the hair loss resource I wish existed when I was a young man so that the young men of today don't have to go through all the bullshit I went through when I found out I was losing my hair because hair loss sufferers deserve better than that. Back then, if you were to go online and look up information about hair loss, basically all you would ever see were hysterical forum posts from people telling you that finasteride is a drug that will completely destroy your life in every way you can imagine. Oftentimes, these exact same people would swear that there are natural and safe ways to regrow your hair, like hanging upside down while massaging your scalp or using various snake oils like rosemary, saw palmetto, or biotin, or even eating broccoli. I unfortunately fell victim to this fear-mongering and pseudoscience back when I was young and impressionable, and it cost me my hairline, which I had to spend $15,000 trying to restore to just a semblance of what it once looked like. I know that all that could have been avoided if I had just trusted the science over the online anecdotes and stayed on finasteride rather than panicking whenever I read some bogus horror story on the hair loss forums. When I learned how to become scientifically literate enough to properly interpret hair loss research, though, I realized just how absolutely full of shit these fear mongers really were. That is when I decided that enough was enough. The narrative behind hair loss needed to change once and for all. The scientific reality behind hair loss had been drowned out by these loud, obnoxious conspiracy theorists, incel, neckbearded dorks for way too long. Hair loss sufferers desperately needed a voice that would amplify the scientific reality about hair loss treatments so that people could make medical decisions based on actual scientific data rather than unverified online anecdotes. And if that voice had to be me, then so fucking be it. And so here we are today, many years later, and I am happy to tell all of you hair loss witchers that we are winning. There are still finasteride fear mongers online, of course, but they no longer dominate the online narrative like they used to. These days, they're largely just considered to be a joke, and whenever they come online to post their lame sob stories that all follow the same generic template, or they post some rat studies from Dr. Trash or Dr. Earwood about steroids, they usually get laughed out of the room completely. Ten years ago, it was unimaginable that any of these finasteride haters would get this kind of pushback, but today, they do, and oftentimes, the pushback I see comes from people who use many of the same talking points I established in my own videos, which of course is a great honor to me because it tells me that my content is working and my objectives have been successful. But we shouldn't think for a moment that finasteride or even dutasteride is the final frontier of hair loss research.
It turns out that there is something possibly even better than finasteride and dutasteride that has been right under our very noses this whole time. Like I said earlier, my educational background is in kinesiology and exercise science. So my background in human movement combined with my passion for fighting hair loss has led me to wonder, is it possible that there may be some overlap between these two subjects? Training human movement, especially when it comes to weight-bearing compound movements, is already known to stimulate many changes to the human organism. All of them are very positive. So is it possible that human physiology and human kinetics could possibly be combined to benefit hair growth? Well, we already know pretty well that exercise has anti-aging and many longevity benefits. That is why we have an eccentric centimillionaire like Brian Johnson who spends most of his time and his days exercising, fasting, and dieting to the point that he now has the body of a 20-something year old. Yet, with all the known benefits of exercise on our health, why has there been so little attention paid to one of the biggest detriments to our health, at least our mental health? I'm of course talking about the slaphead curse of androgenic alopecia. But tell us, are you turned on or turned off? <laughs> Nadine, what happened? He kind of looks a bit old and he's baldy like me da and... No. Okay. To put this all into perspective, on one hand we have a disease, androgenic alopecia, which we know is caused by the trash hormone DHT. And on the other hand, we have an intervention in the form of exercise that can also affect our hormones in various ways. So how do these two seemingly unrelated subjects interact with each other? And if they do interact, could we possibly utilize this interaction to our advantage to help stop and reverse hair loss? Well. As usual, Chooms, it is time to go balls deep into the influence of exercise on hair loss so that we can unravel this mystery once and for all. As most of my viewers already know, here at the Hair Cafe Institute of Scientific Research and Integrity, we have a dedicated team of Solarian scientist researchers who work around the clock night and day to delve into all the medical archives available on the internet on the subject of hair loss. In the past, we have used this elite team of hair loss researchers to delve deeply into hair loss lore and to uncover and share with you many classic hair loss articles by some of the superheroes of the Hair Cafe cinematic universe. I'm of course talking about many protagonists like Dorothy Osborne and Julian Imperato McGinley, as well as some of the evil villains like Dr. Albert Kligman, who did his experiments on prisoners, as well as post finasteride syndrome apologists like Dr. Trash and Dr. Earwig. But if we want to really uncover the hidden enigmas of hair loss in human movement science, we're going to have to go back even further in time than that. We'll have to go back at least a generation before the time of any of these hair loss researchers so that we can find the first article that ever looked at the link between physical activity and hair loss. After many, many hours of scouring every scientific journal resource I could possibly find, I finally found it. It's this article right here, which is a series of case reports published in 1895 by a gentleman named Dr. James Bailey. The article is entitled, quote, unexpected regrowth of hair in circus strongmen, unquote. In the article, James Bailey made an interesting observation that circus performers who performed feats of strength that loaded the axial skeleton, like squats, deadlifts, calf raises, and circus dumbbell presses, they would experience a cessation or even a reversal of their hair loss. So... Here are some of the examples he showed in this article. As you can see, there is very little evidence of androgenic alopecia in any of these cases. And keep in mind, this is many, many years before things like finasteride and minoxidil existed. So, the tools to explain the hair growth phenomenon among circus strongmen, it didn't exist yet back then. So this was, of course, completely observational data. Keep in mind that in 1895, this was long before we even knew what DHT was or had the tools to measure things like hormones. But nevertheless, this research is notable as it is the first recorded correlation between certain weight-bearing exercises and hair regrowth. Dr. Bailey made note of the fact that other circus performers who were physically gifted, like acrobats, 
cats, tightrope walkers, and jugglers did not experience this hair regrowth phenomenon despite their athleticism, so he attributed the hair regrowth benefit to the specific movements that strongmen engage in, specifically axial loaded weight bearing strength movements, including squats, deadlifts, presses, and calf raises. Of course, I don't need to tell you, Chooms, that correlation does not equal causation. So based on this data alone, we could just write this off as being coincidental or being due to other factors. Honestly, even though this paper is very interesting to me, I wouldn't have drawn anything conclusive from it other than it just being an interesting observation that was made in the 19th century. I probably never even would have known about this particular research or reported about it here if it weren't for the fact that I just came across this paper, which was just published last month, that puts the original observation by by James Bailey into an entirely different perspective, it made me realize that we really do need to take his observations very seriously. This recent paper is titled, quote, Musculofollicular Stimulation of the WNT Wind Pathway in a CYP182 Knockout Rat Model of Androgenic Alopecia, Clarifying the Dihydrotestosterone Paradox and Rate-Limiting Recovery Factors." Unquote. This article is from Good Korea, which is a nation that takes hair loss very, very seriously, of course. That's why trends like Korean beauty standards have been blowing up globally for the past couple of years. Needless to say, I was very excited to find this article, but unfortunately, like many other recently published articles on hair loss, it is behind a mammoth paywall costing 134,000 Korean won, which is equivalent to about 99 US dollars. And this doesn't even buy you the article, it just allows you to rent it for 48 hours. But being that I am a hair loss witcher trained at the School of the Wolf at Care Morin, I was able to contact the publishers of the article personally, and I used the Axie sign on all of them in order to convince them to give me the article completely for free. So the hair loss knowledge they've so greedily sealed away from the public now belongs to me, and as an extension, it now also belongs to all of you. Because knowledge should always be free, right Chooms? So here is the full article. Now, I know what you're all thinking right now. Oh, what's this supposed to be, Kevin? Yet another rat study, I see. You always say that rat studies are bogus when you criticize anti-finasteride research, yet here you are posting a study about rodents and expecting us to take it seriously. You have no intellectual consistency and how you present your research, and you're so biased, so ha ha. Well, hold on for a minute, Chums. If we are looking at cutting-edge, state-of-the-art hair loss research, sometimes we do have to look at rat studies because preliminary research begins with rodents. Even the research on finasteride initially started off as just rodent research, but today it is a clinically proven product that has been tested in tens of thousands of human subjects. Rat studies from today can turn into clinical research studies involving thousands of human subjects in less than a decade. So let's not throw out the rats with the bathwater here just yet. Besides, this study actually resurrects Dr. Bailey's old hypothesis. In the introduction, the researchers say, quote, Anecdotal reports of hair regrowth in men undergoing strength training exercises date back over a century. Yet until now, no one has examined any connection between certain forms of exercise, despite the fact that exercise is known to upregulate thousands of gene loci as well as activate growth stimulating pathways, while at the same time inhibiting inflammatory factors and reducing free radical oxygen species. It is scarcely credible that a link between the microenvironment of the dermal papilla and physical activity would not exist." Unquote. The methods of this study, like many rat studies, are highly complex, so I won't go over every single detail, but what makes the methodology especially interesting here is that the investigators didn't just submit the rats to traditional rodent-based exercises like an exercise wheel. They actually devised an ingenious scheme to isolate the exercise to the rat's upper bodies and to their lower bodies, as you can see in these figures here. So, what were the results of all this? Well, as expected, weight training exercise in general had multiple beneficial effects for the hair. As you can see, weight-based exercise activated growth factors such as VGEF, IGF-1, alpha prime, as well as activated both the SHH, the sonic hedgehog pathway, and the all-important wind pathway. All these are crucial for hair regrowth. Meanwhile, negative growth factors that destroy the hair follicles and are downstream effects of DHT, like TGF-beta-1, were inhibited. So, 
Resistance training remarkably has similar biochemical effects on the hair as taking finasteride or dutasteride. But on a more practical level, the rats who underwent lower body muscular strength training had much faster hair regrowth than the rats who just did aerobic training in their exercise wheel or did upper body weight training exercises. So even though the investigators found that exercise in general enhanced growth factors, they were initially at a loss to explain the fact that it is specifically lower body strength training that stopped hair loss and promoted growth more than any other form of exercise. So they next did a series of experiments looking at physiological parameters like blood flow and also the upregulation of antigen receptors as well as follicular DHT levels. This is all summarized in these tables and graphs that you can see very clearly here. <clears throat> okay, moving on. The bottom line is that the good Koreans found evidence that lower body exercise had several specific effects on hair growth and the hair cycle. Here are the main effects that they found. Number one, there was upregulation of 11,872 specific genes and downregulation of 13,566 other specific genes. Admittedly, the function of all these genes is pretty obscure, but all the genes were found to be specific. Number two, upregulation of angiogen receptors in the muscles of the lower body occurred. This was also seen with the upper body exercises, but given that the muscle mass of the lower body was greater than the upper body, there was more overall upregulation in the lower body. This resulted in decreased serum DHT levels due to increased angiogen receptor binding in the muscles and decreased DHT binding in the scalp. Number three, Post-exercise edema occurred, and it led to the shunting of blood flow from the scalp to the muscles, resulting in reduced blood flow to the scalp. Well, you may think that lowered blood flow is a bad thing, but actually, the opposite is true. It is well known that low oxygen levels in the scalp actually are a stimulus to hair growth. That is how the drug stimoxidine works. Hypoxic environments, contrary to popular belief, are optimal for hair regrowth, and more muscular edema means more blood in the muscles, and therefore less blood in the scalp scalp and thus less oxygen. Number four, finally, it is well known that stabilizing and moving heavy weights with the lower body results in oscillating forces that can vibrate and spread to the scalp. This is what the researchers call the, quote, mechanico-follicular feedback loop, unquote. This predominantly occurs when performing movements like the high bar squat, since with the high bar squat, the barbell is placed on top of the trapezius. The trapezius, it is basically just this large diamond-shaped muscle in the back that connects to the base of the skull, which in turn connects to the connective tissue of the skull, including the gallia aponeurotica. Barbells, they have something called a whip. You might have heard of it. What a whip is, it's basically the flex that you notice when you're loading up a barbell that can cause it to feel like it almost bounces when you do certain movements movements like squats. This extra momentum can help assist the lifter through movements performed with a great deal of velocity like Olympic movements, and it requires a great deal of skill to master. But almost all barbells, even ones designed for slower powerlifting movements, will have some degree of barbell whip. When you're performing a barbell squat with enough weight, like at least 125 kilograms, this will cause the bar to bounce on the trapezius as you perform a squat with a full range of motion. These oscillating forces combined with the heavy resistance on the trapezius will vibrate, and the vibrations will be transmitted up the kinetic chain that connects the trapezius to the connective tissue of the scalp. This oscillating force will help break up scalp calcification as well as prevent scalp fibrosis, which are the end stages of antritic alopecia. What's especially notable is that this effect of reversing scalp calcification and fibrosis does not occur with upper body movements. So this suggests that it's not just resistance training which is important for hair growth, but also bar placement and exercise selection. Movements where the load is placed closer to the scalp produce superior outcomes to other forms of resistance training. So if you're doing squats at the gym, for instance, it's probably better to place the bar in the high bar Olympic squat position rather than the low bar ego lift position of Mark Ripple tits. That's why Olympic weightlifters who train with high bar back squats and front squats like Piros Dimas and Dmitry Klokov have full heads of hair while most power lifters end up looking like bald pregnant sumo wrestlers. So I wouldn't say this is a full-blown replacement for finasteride, at least not yet, but this is still pretty convincing research from our friends in good Korea. Clearly the next step here is human studies, but at the very least, I do think leg training should be seen as a potentially effective adjunctive therapy for fighting hair loss. Skipping 
leg day and developing a muscular upper body will make you look like an absolute buffoon. So it's not like we necessarily needed another reason to train our legs. But the fact remains that leg training may be yet another tool that we can use to defeat the slaphead curse. And that is a blessing because it gives us even more motivation to hit the gym hard, which of course has a long list of health benefits. So hopefully for those who watch this video and don't do barbell training yet, this will inspire you to take up barbell training. After all, the only thing more attractive and sexy to a woman than a full head of hair is a chiseled muscular physique brought on through years of dedication of pumping cold hard iron. Don't believe me? Well just take a good look at Jason Blaha here. I rest my case. Thank you for watching Hair Loss Witchers. God bless.